have a very Merry Christmas as well. Same to you as well. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have, um, I won't be long. I do have a few comments, but I also do have a, a couple of questions about the bill. You know, there are some components of this bill, um, some aspects of it that I do agree with, and there are some, probably more so, that I do not agree with. <clears throat> and the question is, my, in my mind today is going to be, does the part that I don't support outweigh the parts that I do support? And it's unfortunate that this bill is all in one package. It should have been divided, and each bill should have been voted on separately based on the merit. And that is the way I believe the proper thing to do it is here. But we somehow seem to always get caught in a situation where we you know we have some people that support some of the bill and some don't. don't. And uh, it just puts people in tough situation. And I certainly don't agree with that philosophy or um, that strategy. But we, here we are today, Mr. Speaker. Um, I do have a couple of questions, but I, on the gas tax holiday, we are talking about extending the gas tax holiday. But what I think people don't understand is what we're actually talking about is letting it go a little bit longer, but we are phasing out the tax credit that we have given to our constituents. I have an issue with that. I believe that the tax holiday should be done, should be just continue on, uh, address it at a later date. Our, <coughs> excuse me. Our residents are going to be seriously feeling the pinch this winter with heating. So while we are maybe extending it, please understand that we are phasing it out. So what you are asking me to do here today is to phase out a tax break that we all agreed to give our constituents. And that's, I struggle with that issue. Um, Mr. Speaker, the good chairman over there had talked about the $330 million in tax revenue that the state will not be collecting when this program is all said and done. But I, I'm, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I am certain due to inflation, we must have recovered more than $330 million in tax revenue due to inflation. And I was wondering through you, Mr. Speaker, to the good chairman, would he have that figure by any chance? Representative Scanlon. Through you, Mr. Speaker, if the... Uh Representative is asking me whether I know what the difference is between how much we've collected in taxes uh, since the price of gasoline increased versus the $330 million. I do not have that figure off the top of my head. No. Representative Master Francesco. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you. I, I wasn't sure if you would have that, but I'm pretty certain that the $330 million that our residents are not paying into the gas tax, the state has made up on other ends because due to inflation. Our diesel in tax increasing 23% is certainly going to affect families when they go shopping and they buy food because every delivery, every truck certainly depends on diesel. And when those costs rise, uh, goods and services and products rise. So I understand, and the good chairman can correct me if I'm wrong, over the course of the four or five months that the gas tax holiday has been in effect, I believe I was reading that the average savings to people is about sixty-two. <coughs> excuse me, sixty-two dollars during that time. Is that correct? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Scanlon. Through you, Mr. Speaker. It's very hard for me to calculate that. It's twenty-five cents per gallon. So some people drive a lot, and that's a lot more savings. Some people don't drive the car except to get groceries once a week. Right? It depends on on how much their uses is. Um, but what I do know for a fact is that for the last eight months, the residents of the state of Connecticut are, are one of only people who live in five different states in the entire country, meaning 45 other states did not give any break. Every single gallon of gas that anybody has bought here in the state, they have got a 25 cent reduction on the price of that gas. And to most of the people that I talk to, uh, while that's not going to solve the overall global problem that's causing that gas to be high, I think they do appreciate the fact that we're giving them a quarter back every time they could buy a gallon of gas. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Master Francesco. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And um, yes, I agree. It's great that the residents received the 25%, 25 cents tax break. But again, we're standing here today asking to phase that out, which is where I have a concern. 
The, the other um, area that I wanted to touch on through you, Mr. Speaker, is the premium pay. So back in October, there was a program the governor announced called Wage Supports for Early Childhood Education. <clears throat> and, that, um, and that provided one-time payments of $1,000 for um, full-time workers and $400 for part-time workers. The cost to the state on that was $70 million, and those were for essential workers as well. Through you, Mr. Speaker, if somebody qualified for that program and was paid out, would they also qualify for the premium pay program through you? Representative Scanlon. Through you, Mr. Speaker, they would, and I would just add that um, I have a three-year-old son and a four-month-old son, son, and when I went to drop my kids off the other day, uh, the workers at the daycare came up to me, and this doesn't happen often to us because we have, <laughs> you know, most people don't really follow what we do here too closely, but uh, they said, I just want to thank you because I saw you on the news talking about this program, and I hope you know how much it means that we're finally getting that recognition because this is a really, really hard job. And I think every one of the 151 of us would agree that serving as a child care provider during the worst of COVID number one was a very, very difficult job, but number two enabled all of us to actually do the work that we do outside of working in this chamber. And I think it is not too much to ask of us to give those people access to two of those programs for all that they did for us uh, during the difficult time that we've had in the Connecticut for the last few years as parents. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Master Francesco. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And through you, Mr. Speaker, I was wondering, would you know how much the state has paid out on that? So far, I know the fund was started with $70 million. How many people actually applied for that program and that was granted through you? Representative Scanlon. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I do not know that was an executive branch decision that was made uh, using you know, the federal ARPA dollars, and, and I don't have an accounting of, of what that was and, and how many people benefited from that. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Master Francesco. Thank you. Um, so if I can understand you correctly, people that have applied for this program, they are essential workers. They will also be able to be entitled to the premium pay bonus. So if somebody was getting $1,000 for the um, child care program, the support for ch early childhood educations, they could potentially get another $1,000 through the pandemic pay. Is that correct through you, Mr. Speaker? Representative Scanlon. Through you, Ms. Speaker, if they were a 1A or a 1B essential worker, uh, and they met the income eligibility requirements of the essential, I'm sorry, of the premium pay program, yes, in theory, that person would be able to benefit from that second program as well, through you. Representative Master Francesco. Thank you, and I would assume that all of the child care workers uh, um, fall under a 1A or 1B. Would that be a correct analysis through you, Mr. Speaker? Representative Scanlon. Through you, Mr. Speaker, that's my understanding, but I can't speak with definality that every single one of them would through you. Representative Master Francesco. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. So they're actually getting paid twice. There is another program out there called the COVID-19 Relief Fund for Essential Workers, um, and it was for workers who contracted COVID-19 and were out of work. Maybe they had a quarantine or so forth. Through you, Mr. Speaker, do we know, do the same workers, do they also qualify for a second um, bonus, I guess? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Scanlon. Through you, Ms. Speaker. So on the essential workers program, I would not characterize it as a bonus. That program is structured in a very specific way so that if you died during COVID and you could prove that you died because of the work that you were doing or you got sick and missed time because of that, again, just for the period that you had COVID, you could go to the state and ask them to compensate you for that. One of the reasons that we're standing here today and taking 27 million of the 34 million that was allegedly allocated for that program is because very few people were actually eligible for the essential workers program and took us up on that ability. Uh, there's a number of reasons behind why that is, but I think it's important to note that that was a very undersubscribed program, which is why 27 million of the 34 million allocated for that is essentially being swept to cover this program. So there really is not too much overlap on that one, though it is possible that 
a few people, and I say a few because only a few have ever qualified for this, could be eligible for the essential workers program and the premium pay program. Through you, Ms. Speaker. Representative Master Francesco. Thank you. Um, When they are determining who qualifies for the premium pay, and somebody had actually also received the wage support for early childhood education or probably through the COVID-19 relief fund, is there any consideration to um, hold off on that and give that give the funding to somebody else ahead of them? Like, is there a, a criteria? I know they have to meet a criteria, but they were already paid out once. Do they automatically move to the top of the line? If they qualify, or would somebody else be bumped, I guess, through you, Mr. Speaker? Representative Scanlon. Through you, Ms. Speaker, um, no, I would not say that somebody's being bumped. Through you, Ms. Speaker, what I would say is if this bill passes today, we will send checks to 155,000 people and 730, okay? So what that means is that all of those people, and I can't say simultaneously we'll get this money. There will be a process, like everything else, for the Comptroller's Office to send those checks out in January, but there's no line, so to speak, in which some person would get it over somebody else. And again, uh, secondary to that, I would just state for the record here that we're talking about a very specific occupation being eligible for both, and that specific occupation is the people who took care of small children during the pandemic that we all just experienced and did all of us parents that were working parents an incredible service uh, by continuing to go in every day and care for our children so that we could go to our jobs. Um, so I just want to state for the record that we're talking about a very specific subset of the essential workers uh, and it's an undefined number of people who qualify for both. Through you, Ms. Speaker. Representative Master Francesco. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for answering that question. My concern with the premium pay program is there were thousands of people who lost their jobs during COVID. There were thousands of businesses that had to shut down and they lost their livelihoods because of our response to COVID. The essential workers that the CDC determines are essential. It's just a determination by them, right? To me, every worker in this state is essential. Every job is essential. And I, I would assume most people would agree with me on that. I'm very concerned. This is not the role of government. I am certain that the healthcare workers when COVID hit, didn't even think twice about it because they are committed to their profession. They didn't do it because they thought down the road that they would be getting a pandemic pay. They did it because they care about the health of the people that they take care of. So they were not doing it for the money. And here we are today looking at a situation where thousands of people have lost their jobs, businesses had to close, people in the healthcare profession and those 1A and 1B essential workers were very fortunate to be able to continue to work during COVID and to provide for their families where other people have not. They went out unemployment. They had a dip into their 401ks. And here we are rewarding them because they just did their job that they signed up to do. And that's where I really have concerns. Um, I'm also concerned about when all of this COVID money that we got from the federal funding for COVID runs out. I have seen over the last couple of years since I've been here, a lot of new programs developed. Now, whether they were used with ARPA funds or not is irrelevant, I get. You have things in the general fund, the transportation fund, and so forth. But at the end of the day, we've increased a lot of spending. What will happen when we don't have that money left anymore? We increase money to put health care in for illegal immigrants. We've voted on baby bonds for people who were born and need assistance. 
doulas, another new program that we passed. I'm very concerned when all of this money goes away, who is going to pay for this? And then are we going to be coming back here to this legislature asking for, well, we can't cut the program because every time you talk about cutting a program, it affects people because they're used to it. These are my concerns, Mr. Speaker. And not that our health care workers are not heroes. Of course they are. Every worker to me is a hero. Our veterans are the real true heroes in this country who fought and died for us to give us the opportunity to be here. But I don't believe the role of government is to provide premium pay or pandemic pay, whatever we want to call it, for someone to do their job, which they were happy to do. I don't, I'm sure they were very happy to do and very proud and we're thankful for the work that they did. But I think there is other ways that this money could have been invested into the long-term future of this state to provide jobs that will affect everybody, to provide relief, tax relief to our businesses, um, lower regulations, to make the Connecticut more affordable. Because in the end, what we're doing here is just putting a Band-Aid on a long-term problem. And that Band-Aid is going to come off at some point, and it's going to sting. We need to solve the problem, not just make it temporary. I know we're trying to do a good thing here, but um, Connecticut, we have a lot of problems. We need to reduce our spending, get the state back on track. And yes, we have a big surplus. All I heard was for the last four months is how much of a surplus we have. It should be used very, it should be used wisely and put into long-term programs that are going to affect the economy in the state of Connecticut to bring long-term growth to every resident in the state and not make people more dependent on the government, to rise them up, to make them feel independent, to get them on their feet again. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you uh, to the chairman for answering my questions. I have no further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam.